Hello. So today we will be talking about the first branch of government, Article 1 in the Constitution, the U.S. Congress. It is housed in this building. It's the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. Um, roll call. I can't show this to you or YouTube will, will copyright strike me. Uh, I can't show this to you, but Roll Call, which is a, a, a publication, uh, does this series called Congressional Hits and, and Misses. It's just uh, funny and silly things that happen in the U.S. Congress on a weekly basis. This one uh, I found particularly funny I wanted to share with you. So click the link and watch it, but I can't share it with you on this, this video. So Congress, as I said, is set up in Article 1. It gets its authority from Article 1 in the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, they have all legislative powers. So when we get to the presidency, uh, we'll find that the president has all executive power. When we get to the courts, the Supreme Court and inferior courts have all judicial power. So members of the House are elected every other year by the people of the several states. Again, when this was written, there were just kind of, well, several states. Um representatives they have to be 25 they have to be a citizen of the united states for seven years they have to um, live in the state where they are going to be elected from they don't necessarily have to live in the district uh, they run for election in uh, although that is a good idea that they eventually uh, get there. Uh, do they have to live in the state for X number of years? Well, then, no, they have to live in the state and establish residency requirements for, I mean, X number of, of months or years or whatever the state election law says. So that's not a federal um, issue because if you remember our study of federalism, the states run elections. So whatever the state residency requirement is, that's what the rule is. But I would remember certainly representatives have to be 25 years old and a citizen of the U.S. for seven years. They have to live in the state where they're elected. That will certainly be a test question. So Article 1 also says, And the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So this is just uh, 18th century speak for anybody who is qualified to vote for a representative will be allowed to do so. That's all. I know sometimes the jargon can get a little bit confusing, so break that down. Each state has, at a minimum, one representative, and it all has to do with population. Uh, the number of representatives is certainly it's determined by the census. And we have one representative, or we should. Again, this is the system that we have versus the system that was set up for us. They're not congruent in the least. Uh, but we ha should have at least one rep for every 30,000 people. So there is an argument certainly here uh, that we are massively underrepresented. So I wanted to pull this article up. It's a couple of years old. Uh, it was published in 2018. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, it, we're supposed to have one representative for every 30,000 people. And uh, we certainly have one of the largest represent representation ratios uh, amongst the, uh, the OECD nations, so the developed uh, nations. So the U.S. here, 747,184 people per representative. Nowhere close to 30,000. So there is certainly a, a case to be made. Uh, certainly for, for massively, massively expanding the size of the House of Representatives if we want, you know, equal representation. You know, some of these, a lot of these countries are not certainly as big as us. 
you know, we see Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg here, 10,033 people per representative. Luxembourg is a very, you know, it's, it's a little dot on a map. If you, <laughs> if you look, you know, Austria, the Czech Republic, um, None of these are, are exactly equivalent uh, according to population size. So why can't we massively expand the size of the House of Representatives? Good idea, maybe, uh, but it's because of this, the Permanent Apportionment Act of 1929. This would might be something I'd, I'd remember uh, for purposes of the test. So... The House in 1929 fixed the number of representatives at 435. Um, they got into a fight uh, back in the day about uh, apportionment. So, uh, again, the state's House delegation um, is based on population. Uh, the Constitution, though, doesn't say how uh, though how future congresses should be should be set up how big the house should be in other words uh, so we reapportion the house after every federal census 2020 uh, when that all gets finalized the house will be reapportioned again illinois will probably lose a house seat maybe two uh, so the uh, the states uh, had a, a little bit of a battle in the house and the House failed to reapportion itself after the 1920 census. Uh, so they passed this act, and the House membership was capped uh, at levels established by the 1910 census and created this procedure for automatically reapportioning house seats and uh, you know people had their they certainly certainly had their views on it but this uh, you know it, it's just kind of the way it's it's been so when vacancies happen in the house in any state, whether it be through through death or resignation, uh, the House expels one of its members. The Constitution says the executive authority, meaning the governor of the state, uh, issues writs of election to fill the vacancy. So there's a special election held to fill a seat that comes open at some point in the term for uh, the House of Representatives. The House has the power to choose its speaker and other officers. The House also has the sole power of impeachment. Uh, so the speaker, um, that's all it says, the House shall choose its speaker. The House, in theory, uh, could choose whoever is listening to this as its speaker. The, the speaker of the House doesn't have to be a politician. The speaker of the House doesn't have to be even a member of the House, uh, it's just uh, tradition uh, that's really dictated that, uh, that that be the case. The House also has the sole power to impeach anybody, uh, a president all the way down. Uh, there is an impeached, a person who was impeached by uh, the House of Representatives that is currently serving in the House of Representatives, and I'll pull his information up. He's an interesting guy. So this man, uh, Alcy Hastings, Representative Hastings, uh, in short, and I'm just I'm just giving you a a, a couple sentences about the case, uh, was a Carter appointed judge in Florida who uh, took bribes in a, a mob case for. Uh, reduction in sentence, and he was impeached by the House of Representatives, uh, but not barred from holding future office, which is why he's in the uh, the U.S. House of Representatives right now. 
I thought that was an interesting little uh, tidbit. I just recently learned about that myself and thought I would share it with you. So the House has the sole power of impeachment. I mean, the, the most current uh, examples of that would be the two impeachments of, of President, former President, rather, Trump. So the House elects its speaker. Uh, obviously, I can't show you the video. It's just, it's kind of the end, end result where Nancy Pelosi was, was elected. Uh, but it was close. Uh, we didn't have a full House uh, voting uh, this time around. This, this doesn't add up to 435, um, which lowered the bar for Nancy Pelosi to get in uh, again. But these were the two main contenders. This is the minority leader. Uh, Republican Kevin McCarthy from California. This is obviously Speaker Pelosi. Uh, so Pelosi got 216 votes to McCarthy's 209. So it was close. It was close. But this goes to what I was saying, though. Uh, Tammy Duckworth, our senator, received a vote. Um, so did Hakeem Jeffries, who was another representative. Three just voted present. Three didn't bother to vote. But the election of the Speaker is the first vote that is cast in a in a new Congress. Uh, the speakership is is an enormously important and powerful position. Um, I mean, uh, they influence all sorts of legislation, uh, determine what kind of comes onto the floor and what doesn't. Has a say, a big say in committee assignments. Um, it's powerful, and. Uh, Obviously, they're, they're, they're um, second in, in the line of succession after the vice president to the presidency as well. So, um, very important. And this, I regret, I can't, I told you a little bit about it, but this is uh, about a five minute video on what exactly the speaker does, which I would encourage you to, you know, pull up the slides and, and click on this, this link. I, I wish I could, you know, to, do more, but I it's just the 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 rules, man. You know, uh, it's it's difficult to make this class uh, online anytime, anyway, as interactive as I'd like because of the internet and the rules therein. So, uh, moving on to the Senate, each state gets two senators. Uh, there are three classes, regardless of population. So there could be, you know, Wyoming, where where former Vice President Cheney lives, uh, and I think probably he's the only one that lives there. And you could have California with 55 electoral votes and you know millions and millions of people. Uh, they each get two senators, regardless of population of the state. And again, I, there are three classes of senators. It's just they, they class them, you know, just by the, the term they're elected. So, you know, it's just really just says when they're up for election. That's the only significance, really, of the classes. If there's a vacancy here, though, there's a difference. The governor can fill the seat. The governor just has the power to fill the seat for the remainder of, of the term. Call you up. Hey, you want to do it? Go to the Senate. Yep. Uh, that's happened in our state. Uh, the governor, uh, Rod Blagojevich, he obviously went to prison for a while, tried to fill President Obama's Senate seat uh, in an illegal fashion. So senators, the age requirement's a little, a little higher. 30 years old, a resident of the United States for at least nine years, and an inhabitant of that state for which he or she shall be chosen. He is just what's written in the Constitution. Uh, so our, we have, we've had some pretty young senators. President Biden uh, was certainly one of the youngest. He was 29 when he was elected senator from Delaware, and he, you know, he couldn't vote for a year. He just sat in the Senate. And when he turned 30, he was sworn in, and then he could, he could fulfill all the obligations of, of a senator. And uh, vice president is president of the Senate. 
uh, Kamala Harris, you know, she won't have a vote unless there's a tie. So a 50-50 split. And since we have a 50-50 Senate, um, I'd anticipate that happening this term quite a bit. And the Senate also has the power to choose their officers, a president pro tempore, uh, in the absence of the vice president, leads. So the president pro tempore, in this case, is, um, let me pull it up, is this guy, uh, Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont. Uh, Mr. Leahy is, is 80 years old. Uh, he is a Democrat. And, yeah, he comes after the speaker in the line of succession. So another important figure, the, the former um, president pro tempore was uh, this guy, Charles Grassley. And they, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of an honorary sort of position. There aren't too many duties attached to it. They preside uh, sometimes, you know, uh, most of the time, though, uh, the, you know, the gavel passes amongst uh, junior senators and other, other senators so they can practice and learn parliamentary procedure. Uh, so, that's that's uh, really what it is. The president pro tempore is usually uh, the most senior senator from the majority party, and not not in terms of age, in terms of uh, length of of service. Normally, those two things correlate, so that's why you have an eighty year old man uh, who is you know the the, in, the president pro tempore. Um, so, but he, he leads the Senate. He is uh, in charge when uh, the Senate is uh, without the vice president, which is most of the time. And if the president, the vice president becomes president, then, you know, then he steps up. Hopefully we never get there, never have to experience that. So that would be terrible, truly terrible. And the Senate has the power to try all impeachments, the sole power. Now, let me talk just very briefly about what an impeachment is. Uh, a pe an impeachment is a removal from office. So the House impeaches. They say, you know, uh, just I'm just taking the most recent case. Uh, you know, President, former President Trump did uh, this, that, and the other thing. And then they walk it down to uh, the House, selects a, a set of managers who will prosecute the case, and they walk the articles down to the Senate. And as soon as the Senate receives those articles, uh, they hold a trial in which uh, they determine the innocence or, or guilt uh, of the official. I said the president. In this case, it could be any any number of, of people. Uh, I showed you uh, Representative Hastings. You know, uh, it could be a judge. It could, any sort of federal official uh, has uh, can be impeached by the House and tried by the Senate. And this has happened uh, from, from, you know, time to time in our history. It's always, you know, a, a sad occasion when when somebody has done something to merit impeachment and a trial uh, so all that an impeachment that's what an impeachment is what the senate does when they if they convict so if they find the federal official whether it be the president all the way down to a judge all the way down to you know whoever is a federal office holder if they find them guilty all that means is they're out of office they're removed from office um, that's it. Then whoever, the FBI, the local police, whoever it is, takes it from there and prosecutes according to the law after that. Um, I know we're, we're in, I'm recording this video on, on February 1st, 
2021. Uh, the second Trump impeachment trial is, is underway. You know, we're on a little bit of uncharted ground um, now. We've never had a twice impeached president, and we've never, you know, tried to, uh, we've never had a trial for a, a former president either. So I'm interested, you know, and maybe when you're watching this, we'll have an answer uh, to see how they, you know, they, they come up with uh, a solution to this and what they'll do. So uh, senators are all sworn in. They act as jurors. Um, so there are 100 jurors uh, in this case. You know, if a president is tried, the chief justice presides at the hearing. This is what the Constitution says. So John Roberts, in this case, uh, would, uh, he certainly presided at the first trial of President Trump. And you have to have two-thirds of the Senate to convict. Uh, 